Hi, Randy. Hi, Bob. Great to have a chance to talk with you again. Well, it has been a while, hasn't it? Uh, I don't know if it goes into decades, but I uh, used to encounter you when I was researching my book on evolutionary psychology, The Moral Animal, I would go to these human behavior and evolution society meetings, and that's where I met you, uh, I think in 1991 maybe. I think one year you were president of that society, were you not? I, I started that society, and about that time you actually came and did a video of me um, at Michigan. Um, that's in- right. You know, now that's, you know who was with me is the now famous documentarian Alex Gibney. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, who even as we speak has uh, an HBO uh, documentary that aired, I guess, last night on Theranos. But I digress. Let me tell people who you are. You are Randolph Nessie. Um, you are uh, the your title now. You're the founding director of the Center for Evolution and Medicine at Arizona State University. You are, among other things, the author of the important book, Why We Get Sick, co-authored with the late and truly great evolutionary biologist uh, George Williams. And now you have uh, written a new book, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, Insights from the Frontier of Evolutionary Psychology. Looks like that for those of you who are watching on video and not just listening on podcast. Right. Um, the, uh, and we want to talk about this book. So I think most everyone listening to this is familiar with bad feelings, you know, sadness, grief, anxiety, and so on. Um, and I guess the premise of your book is that if we want to deal wisely with bad feelings, it would help to know why we have them in the first place, why the human species is prone to them. You know, you're so right. It's not just every, I mean, everybody, everybody has bad feelings. It's not these other people, these people with mental disorders. It really is everybody. And the question I started asking myself after seeing patients for a decade was, why on earth do so many people have so many bad feelings that seem really useless? And this led me to go back to medicine in general, and and it was really my motivation for trying to figure out why bodies weren't better designed in general. I mean, why we have a narrow birth canal and wisdom teeth and the ability to choke. I mean, who designed this thing anyhow? But after really developing the field of evolution in medicine, I'm finally now able to come back to my original love, which is psychiatry and mental problems, and ask the question, not why some people get them, but why we are all are vulnerable. It's a very different question. Yeah, okay. And the, the backdrop for this is what we alluded to earlier. I mean, uh, these meetings of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society studied the way natural selection had shaped human psychology. And, you know, the basic idea is that traits that are grounded in the genes are probably with us by virtue of the fact that during evolution they were conducive to the transmission of the genes that can that that yeah. so if they helped us survive if they helped us reproduce if they helped us help our close relatives survive and reproduce and so on right That's exactly right and see, brains are shaped by natural selection just like everything else so to the extent there is such a thing as human nature that we all share that's where it comes from okay so why don't we take a bad feeling and talk about it. I'm going to take several of them, actually, because I, I think, um, you know, that the human tendency is to want to get rid of bad feelings. That's why we call them bad. Uh, but beyond that, I think sometimes there's an assumption that if you have a bad feeling, there's something wrong in the sense of dysfunction. And I think you're going to say that's not always the case. So let's take something like sadness. What are some reasons... We can be sad, you know, in a, in, explained in a kind of evolutionary context. So I'm going to post, but I mean, sadness is a real hard one, Bob. Can we do something easier first? Can we do take a little bit of anxiety pick, first? Pick. I am beset by bad feelings, so I'll just throw out a list of them, and you can, you can take your pick. Anxiety is, is certainly in my top five, if you'd prefer. Yeah, but yeah. Take whatever bad feeling you want. So, you know, I think the, putting the whole book in a nutshell um, – Emotions, bad emotions are just different symptoms like the symptoms you take to your internist or your family doctor. Uh, Nausea, fever, vomiting, cough, diarrhea, those are all really unpleasant for very good evolutionary reasons. And anxiety, low mood, anger, jealousy, those too are symptoms, not diseases, unless they overshoot. However, they don't seem like they're useful. You know, anxiety is where we start. 
anxiety is so easy because almost everybody says, yep, it's a good idea to stay away from dangerous things and to not go back there if you just about got killed. So that, that is pretty easy for people. But then you go further to something like sadness. I mean, hey, the loss has already happened. I don't care whether it's whether your car got crashed or you lose your spouse or you lose your dog. Um, it's already happened, so why feel bad? What good does that do you? Um, and the question, the way I would reframe that is by saying, is losing something really valuable, something that's happened often enough in the history of our species, that a special mode of operation would be useful in that circumstance? And once you ask it that way, you realize, yeah, actually, people who just go on and don't pay any attention to what they lost, they don't do as very well in the long run. It's much better to pause and see what happened and how to prevent it and how to get what, get what you're missing. All kinds of things need to be done after a loss. Okay. Um, but that is a, the, the, the question, one question you alluded to is a good e example. Um, I mean, let's, let's drill down a little on, on grief. That's where the question arises with real acuteness, like what's the point? The person is dead. Um, yeah. what, what would you say about that? You know, is, I think it's astounding that the question of why grief exists has not been answered. I mean, other people have written saying it's just a side effect, it's an accident of attachment, that's all there is to it. I've suggested that, gosh, this is just so terrible and it pairs people so much, there must be some significance to it. So I actually did a research project for three years with a whole staff of statisticians looking at six hours of interview that were done four different times with people before and after they lost their spouse. And I thought, sure, this would give me the answer because I was pretty sure, Bob, that people who didn't experience grief, there was something wrong with them. And, and we'd see that in the interviews and in their health and other things. But lo and behold, we looked in the data and we found out that the people who didn't, first of all, about a third of people didn't experience much grief. That really opened my eyes. The second thing was that they weren't that different from other people. Um, it turns out there's no one normal way of grieving. Stages of grief, forget it. There's no one normal way. But the, on the other hand, most of us do experience these profound, sad, awful feelings after we lose somebody. And I think it's such a, a mystery still about why on earth that would be the case. I tell the story in the book about somebody who tragically is, is watching her child play on the surf and watches her child be swept away. Mm. So she said, oh, that child's gone. Should I, let's get lunch kids with the other kids. No. You know, the, the, the thing to do when you just is to first of all try to rescue your child and scream for help to get other people to help and make sure the rest of your kids are out of the surf and never let your other kids go in the surf ever again. And, you know, there are all these things that are useful to do after a loss. How much does those have to do with grief, though, Bob? That's an unanswered question. Okay. I gather that, you know, in general – Understanding that a feeling is in some sense natural doesn't by itself tell you whether you need to just kind of live with that feeling, right? And it Absolutely. doesn't tell you whether the feeling is productive. Um, so the biggest misunderstanding of my work, Bob, is, and I'm so glad you gave me a chance to say this early on, people say, oh, Dr. Nessie says that low mood is useful and therefore we shouldn't treat it. We should just put up with it. No. Um, one of my greatest contributions to medicine, I think, is what's called the smoke detector principle, pointing out that there are all kinds of bodily responses like anxiety and fever um, that are kind of inexpensive compared to what would happen if you didn't have it when you need it. And so natural selection shapes those mechanisms to, do, to, to set them off, even a lot of times when not, not really necessary, just to make sure they go off whenever they are necessary. This is why we put up with smoke detectors. I mean, they don't warn us about a fire but once in a lifetime, but they warn us about burned toast you know, every week. We put up with it because that's cheap, while dying in a fire would be really, really awful. Same thing with panic attacks. Most panic attacks are normal but useless. And I think this offers profound insight about how we as clinicians and psychiatrists and just people can think about the kinds of suffering that we have. Um, yes, it's meaningful. Most of it's normal. A lot of it's normal but useless. Some of it is a product of abnormal mechanisms in the brain. We've got to distinguish all those things. But usually we can relieve suffering without interfering with people's lives. Mm -hmm. So I have I made that clear enough? You know, I'd ever, I'm getting a little nervous about talking about this stuff for a general audience because I don't want to be misunderstood and have people think that 
I think you should just put up with your feelings. What I do think you should do, though, is pay attention to them and recognize they have meaning and not just beat yourself up because there's something wrong with you. Uh, they're there for good reason. Right. Now, it seems to me there are – so there are feelings, you know, you should pay attention to. I mean, if, 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 uh, if you're walking through a field that you know is infested with rattlesnakes – you should feel anxiety because that will lead you to be attentive uh, as opposed to, to you know, right. And you remind me I'm living in Arizona now and it's springtime and I should be more careful. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad. Or you could just wear like, I guess, special boots or something. It's your, it's your call. But, um, but there are times, you know, when um, there are reasons not to uh, want to indulge your feelings. And it seems like you, you list, you kind of get at a number of these in the book. It seems like there are two reasons for skepticism, uh, at least selective skepticism toward our feelings. Um, one is to remember that they were designed to get genes into, into the next uh, generation, which is a mission we may or may not want to sign on to, right? I mean, you, you could just decide that's not your big goal, but another one, and I think, probably more important one uh, that you that you mentioned is this idea of mismatch. They were the feelings were designed to get genes into the next generation. And we say designed in quotes, of course, because it's natural selection doing the designing, not a conscious designer. But um, but the, it was a very different environment. So even yeah. if you decide that, yeah, I would like to maximize my genetic proliferation, you should realize that feelings operating in an environment so different from something like the ancestral environment. Uh, may not be doing even that job. So they may not, they may be failing both to make you happy and to get your genes into the next generation. So those are two of the six possible reasons why bodies aren't better designed. And you're absolutely right. Our bodies are in modern environments where we can't help ourselves from eating sweet, salty, fatty stuff that used to be good for our ancestors and kills us. Also, we can't help ourselves from being afraid of snakes and spiders when we don't have much reason to be. We should be afraid of drugs and hypodermic needles and, and guns, but we're not as afraid as we should be of those kind of things. So absolutely mismatch. On the other hand, a lot of people imagine that evolutionary psychiatry is all about the fact that we're living in environments we were never designed for. I think that's a relatively small part of things. What you said before, Bob, about, you know, our brains were actually designed to get us to do things that are good for our genes, not for us. I think that's only begun to be explored, and it intersects with a lot of your interest in Buddhism, it seems to me, because we have all these desires for status and other mm -hmm. kind of things, that, but it's bad for us, which just makes us feel bad, usually. But we can't get away from them very easily because they're very deep. And another example I give is the fact that mortality rates for men are so much higher than those for women. And one of my favorite studies looked with Dan Kruger at for every 100 young women in the United States who's going to die in the next year, how many men die? And I went into that. I thought it was like 120 maybe. Turns out that there's 300, three times more mortality for men. And it's not just human males. It's chimpanzees and fruit fly males because males – we're shaped to do things that are good for their genes to be competitive for mates instead of good for their health. Yeah, well, you mentioned status. I mean, that that's a good example of, I guess, a couple of things. I mean, apparently the reason we pursue it so fiercely is that in the ancestral environment, uh, social status was correlated with, with uh, genetic proliferation, uh, often via direct kind of reproductive success. Um, you know, in a modern environment, you still see, like, uh, you know, high-status males uh, maybe getting a lot of sex, but since they're often using contraception, it's no longer getting their genes in the next generation. Again, not that that's a particularly great thing to begin with, but, but there is the irony of it. And then there's, there's the thing you alluded to, which is like, and this gets at Buddhism, kind of, is, is that you want the thing really badly. You want the status, you want the junk food, whatever you want. But then once you get it, it doesn't satisfy you for very long before you want more. We just, everybody imagines and we're built, we're built to imagine that getting what we want will satisfy us. And, and it never works. Um, 
once people realize that, they have the Buddhist insight of recognizing that really it's all just a trick to get us to do things. That helps a little, but here's a place where you and I can have an interesting conversation. I think you've had more luck and, and are encouraging people to actually try harder to set those desires aside. And my take is that it's terribly hard for most people to be able to do that, and, and for good evolutionary reasons. It is hard. And, um, I mean, that's why, you know, they call meditation a practice. You have to practice before you make much progress via meditation of letting go of these things. And I'm not like, look, I have not, I have not exactly attained enlightenment. I've had modest success. The more I'm meditating, the more success I have. But I'm, uh, you know, it's never the complete relinquishing of what Buddhists call tanha, which is just kind of craving, whatever it is you're, you're, you're craving. No, it's, it's very, um, it's challenging, and I try to be discerning about it. I mean, there are some arenas where pursuing your cravings are more destructive than others, you know? Yeah, that's for sure. And, and so, but, but, but I certainly don't think it's easy. I mean, what do you tell people when they come to you and say, I'm, you know, I'm spending too much online shopping for stuff. Uh, you know, it, there's a desperate feeling about it. Then I buy it and it's, it's not much of a, you know, the, the rush doesn't last long and so on. So I do talk to people about desire and where it comes from and why it's there. It doesn't change things, but one thing it does pretty quickly if people grasp it is at least give you a little sense of humor about our shared human plate. You know, we're, we're all kind of stuck. In, on these treadmills of, of trying to get and do things. But where this becomes more important clinically, Bob, is with depression. And I, I try to distinguish depression. I usually call it low mood because if you say depression, people think, oh, it's abnormal or something wrong with someone. So let's talk about low mood for a second. From my perspective, it's very different from sadness. I mean, sadness happens when there's a loss. You had something, you lost it, it's gone, and it feels awful, but you recover from that because it's a one-time thing that's you know, sharp. Mm -hmm. I think low mood is different, though. I think what low mood is there for, I, I should, actually, I think my greatest contribution to understanding emotions is to stop all of us from saying, what's it for? And instead say, in what situation is it useful? Because most emotions have multiple functions. Mm -hmm. But the situation in which low mood is useful is when your efforts aren't paying off. And when you're trying to go get something or do something or prevent something, and it's just not working, and there's a built-in system in every organism, not just humans, to d disengage motivation and wait and think of another strategy. And if nothing works at all, to give up on that goal entirely. And these things work very well for most people. Most of us wanted to be a sports hero at some time when we were young, and, and we gracefully gave it up when we played right field for too many years in a row. And we also might have wanted to be you know, the greatest philosopher or the greatest doctor or the greatest something, or at least get recognition. Who knows if the greatest people actually get the recognition. But life actually, is a whole I think we know they don't actually in some fields, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I thought it so helpful clinically seeing patients who did have depression to ask this question. Is there something terribly important you're trying to do in life that just isn't working, but you can't give up? Mm -hmm. And often, even after I talked with people for a couple of hours previously, that question brought up all these poignant stories about, you know, Gosh, the most important thing in my life is keeping my daughter from using drugs, and she moved in with a heroin addict, and she won't return my phone calls. And I can't give up, and I can't succeed in contacting her. What am I supposed to do? And then the patient breaks down crying. Or somebody who you know, is desperately in love with someone who's wonderful and can't get that person to quite commit, and they don't want to give up, and they don't want to be trapped in that semi-committed state for longer. What are they going to I mean, So often... People are kind of trapped pursuing unreachable goals. And I think there's good reasons for that also evolutionarily because sometimes there are big payoffs for pursuing big goals. And I, I think we all just are you know, products of this evolved process that leaves us so often dissatisfied by the mismatch between what we're trying to do and what we can do. So do you tell people sometimes just, hey, face it, give it up. You're, there's nothing you can do about your daughter and her, her, her heroin-providing boyfriend. So there was one radio interviewer who said, so Dr. Ness, you tell people they should just give up. And, you know, it's never that easy. Um, the first 15 years of my psychiatric practice, Bob, 
people came to me and they didn't get into medical school four times in a row or they tried to get their spouse to stop drinking for three years. And I said, you know, don't give up, never give up, keep going, don't let your depression in a way. But as I got older and watched, and as I started thinking evolutionarily about what low mood was for, it really helped me to ask more sensitive questions about, gosh, it seems to me you really are trapped pursuing some goal you're not going to reach, but mm -hmm. let's talk about why you can't give it up or find another strategy. There must be really good reasons. So I think it's really crude to tell people, oh, just quit. But it's very sensitive to, to acknowledge the dilemmas people get themselves into. Listen to me, even I talk about get themselves into, people get into uh, one way or another. And that often helps them make hard decisions about whether they want to try to accept their current circumstance or whether they want to pay the price of getting out. This is kind of a tangent, uh, and I won't spend long on it, but do you think a, a kind of a disservice is sometimes being done by the whole kind of mo motivational speaking industry kind of, you can do anything, you can, you know, anyone can be a successful entrepreneur and, and blah, blah, blah. It's not just motivational speaking, Bob. I think it's everywhere. I mean, universities want every one of their students to be the best and the greatest and go on to wonderful things. And gosh, what about most actual people? And the ones who do succeed greatly often are people living, leading unbalanced lives who are, who are really driven. Um, but on the other hand, if you're running a university or a company or, or even you want to see your kids succeed, everybody has excess ambitions for not only themselves but for the people around them. And, and going around and saying, oh, just give up and relax. I mean, nobody wants to hear that. Everybody wants to hear you can do it. And so we like listening to stuff like that. But I think in the long run, as you suggest, it might make us feel bad and might be responsible for part of social media, possibly decreasing the mood of everybody. Okay, so if low mood can sometimes uh, serve the useful function of getting you to reassess the path you're on, um, I mean, first of all, does that in include not chronic low self-esteem, but feelings of, of low self-esteem, like, like feeling like, you know, you encounter frustration repeatedly and you go, you have this phase of going, I'm worthless, I can't do anything. And then finally you muster your resources and, 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 and chart out on it on a different path. Is all that? Yes, I do think so. But, but since you mentioned low self-esteem, I see that as a little bit different than low mood. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I think this also intersects to one of our shared interests. It seems to me, I had a graduate student, Nicole Buttermore, who worked on this very profoundly. Self-esteem is an indicator about how other people value us, I think. Mm -hmm. And we are very sensitive to that because of how natural selection shaped our moral capacities and our relationship capacities. Um, again, you and I have both been strongly influenced by, you know, the transition from naive, you know, group selection to more sophisticated ways of thinking about how natural selection shapes genes for things. And, boy, I was been so – the cynical views of selfish genes make selfish people, I think that's such a social corrosive. Um, I th it's so disheartening for people and, and harmful. But I've spent years and done a couple of books about why on earth and how on earth can natural selection – create genuine love and morality and guilt and, and grief even. And the answer I've come to, I'd be curious what you think about. There's a whole chapter there about mainly what's called social selection, where in fact we all try to please other people mm -hmm. so that we're preferred partners. And those people who are very generous and loyal and honest and helpful and thoughtful, um, we prefer those people as partners. And because we do, they get advantages. And we try to be that way, too, so we get to be, have good partners. So basically, this business of partner choice, I think, creates, by pure selfish interest, we choose the best partners for ourselves, but that becomes a selection force that creates capacities for genuine altruism. How does that fit with your thinking? Yeah, I think it makes sense. It's always important to emphasize that we're not saying that these motivations reside at the conscious level. In fact, the, the, the whole point, the whole interesting thing about feelings is that they are often proxies for an underlying logic that we may not have access to. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in various ways, in the romantic realm, we want to please people and, 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 and be impressive. In the non-romantic realm, in the social realm, we want to present ourselves as effective people, as reliable people, as trustworthy people. And that leads us, you know, on the one hand, you sometimes see people 
again, not necessarily consciously, but exaggerating their worth and their competence. But at the same time, I think it has led to a certain amount of actually good behavior, right? And absolutely. Yeah. That's how, and, and another bit of my work has been on the evolution of capacities for commitment, not just in commitment to your romantic partner, but commitment strategies where you essentially promise to do something in the future that won't be in your interests, like stay with someone in sickness and health or kill them if they betray you. Um, those things can be very powerful motivators and they lead to paradoxical strategies because once you start trying to convince somebody that you'll stay with them in sickness and health before you know it, you're actually doing it. And they are too, if it all works well. And, you know, I was just thinking about this today. Well, maybe it's because I was reading your book, but, but, um, you know, on the one hand, you can be cynical about love. I mean, the reason I was, I was reflecting on my daughters for one thing. And I was thinking, you know, the kind of love I have for them is unlike the kind of love I have for anyone else, including my wife. My wife and I have talked about this. It's like, I yeah, we love I each other. I missed the word there. Your love for what, who? For, my, for my daughters is unlike my love I have for anyone else, including even my wife. And my wife has said the same thing to me. It's like she loves me, but not like she loves our daughters. And it's yeah. easy to get, on the one hand, cynical and say, A, you only, you only love them because they have so many of your genes. And B... By the same token, there are all these people out there that are just as worthy of decent treatment that you don't love. But at the same time, I think we should be grateful that uh, natural selection, a process that when you first hear about it sounds like this dog-eat-dog thing, has given us you know, direct understanding of actual love, of actual pretty close to unconditional love. And then we can reflect on that and, and on the fact that it might be more appropriately deployed more widely. And, you know, that's, that just seems like kind of a gift to me. I don't know. You know, I think this is, you know, I, I think one of the main reasons, Bob, that evolutionary thinking hasn't made more progress in informing medicine and social sciences is because people do stop at the cynical viewpoint of selfish genes and all. And I think a great push of mine has been to help people see that, no, natural selection also explains our capacities for genuine love and, mm -hmm. and morality. Uh, people who just do the right thing when other people are watching are not the kind of people we want as our friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I guess your perspective has something to say about the use of prescription drugs in psychiatry, right? You, you can, I go ahead. It might, not, it might not be what you think though. What, what would you think? Can I just ask you? Your super I, I would think you might say that sometimes uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors can be good and valuably therapeutic. And sometimes they can uh, lead people to not uh, sense the signals that low mood would be sending that could be useful. That would be my guess. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of a, professor who came to me when I was back at Michigan, who in the middle of the summer um, was very depressed. And I got the person who were on a medication. It worked very well. And she lost her depression. And she came back to be see me in September. And she said she was doing so much better. Thank you. And then I got a call from her in November and said, can I come see you again? I said, sure. What, what's going on? She says, well, I'm not, I'm not depressed, but I haven't graded any papers all term. <laughs> and I'm completely relaxed about it, and I'm about to lose my job. Right. And I said, yeah, we we got to talk. Let, let, let's have a conversation. Did you just, was it a question of just recalibrating the... Uh, you the know, it, it was more complicated, as things always are, about her relationship with her job and her boss and, and all kinds of other things. But, so, the, the superficial response to mine is often that we should use drugs less. But, gosh, I think another view is that once you recognize that most of these bad feelings we have are either from the smoke detector principle and they're not necessary or they're for our genes, not us, or because they're in modern environments or because they're from our brains just not working quite right because we don't exercise enough or our omega-3 fatty acids aren't enough or something, then it makes you think, oh, my God, why don't we just go ahead and make everybody feel better if we possibly can? And so my response is really a very medical one. It is that when you see a bad feeling, you should do what a doctor does, and that is try to see where it's coming from, just like you try to see what it, what's causing a cough or what's causing mm -hmm. a bellyache. And only after that do you go ahead and relieve the suffering however you can. But I'm, I'm very keen on 
finding better ways to relieve people's suffering. And we're not that great about it. You know, the reason there are 10,000 books about how to feel better fast is because none of them work all that well. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, what, what is your, uh, your view of, are, are there any, let me, let me ask you this. Are there any, what you might call pre Darwinian, uh, psychotherapeutic traditions that you think have much value, Freudian, Jungian. I mean, strictly speaking, Freud's not pre-Darwinian. He thought he was being Darwinian, but he's pre-modern understanding of how evolution shaped the mind. Are, are there, um, I mean, what, what traditions, uh, you know, ranging from that stuff to cognitive behavioral therapy, do you? Yeah, I think every single one of them can be informed by an evolutionary viewpoint. I put a whole chapter in my book about psychoanalysis, which was kind of a risky thing to do because so many people just dismiss anything associated with psychoanalysis. But Freud had profound insights. At least two of them are really germane to this evolutionary view. The first is that we are prisoners of our des desires, and there are all these systems to keep us from going ahead and pursuing them in ways that, ways that wreck our lives. I mean, mm -hmm. he talked about anxiety inhibiting the id, and that's spot on. I mean, if we didn't have those inhibitions, nobody would like us anymore. And this, this is profoundly important. The other insight he had is that the unconscious – Actually, he didn't say it as clearly as I would have liked. I've tried to say it a few times. Unconscious is there for good reason, and not just to make us feel better, but to adjust our motives so that we don't keep pursuing things that we can't get. And it's so wonderful that, you know, we, we quit thinking about, you know, becoming a baseball player um, and feeling bad about that after a while. We, we quit thinking about all the various things, and then we come to sex, for God's sake. I mean, Freud was spot on there, too. Sex really is at the root of it. Um, but nobody can really satisfy all their sexual desires, so there damn well better be a system there to keep most of them out of consciousness so that we can go about our business. Yeah, and the sex, I think we might say now, doesn't always play into things as directly as Freud might have thought. I mean, the Oedipus Complex, you probably remember the paper that I think Martin Daly and Margo Wilson yeah, wrote I about. I mean, the first thing an evolutionary psychologist would say about the Oedipus Complex is, um, I don't think it makes sense for people to want to have sex with their mothers, given given the likelihood of sex with close kin producing um, genetic pathologies. In fact, that seems to be responsible for the kind of incest, the kind of instinctive incest taboo. taboo. Right. Um, and then Martin and Margo had this kind of ingenious paper, I thought, explaining uh, what is, in fact, often a tension with your uh, with a uh, with a son's father, and may, in some sense, relate to the mother, but they explained it in different terms in, a, in I thought, kind of an ingenious way. Yeah, yeah. The the um. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. Actually, I was I was driving to work and I came up to an intersection like this, and of course, the guy on the right is supposed to have the right away, and that was me, and the other guy starts pulling right in front of me, and I. And I kind of pull in front, and, and so he goes, Aah! it was it was just like the young man Oedipus. I mean, young man Oedipus, what was really going on is he met this older guy at a crossroads, and he wasn't going to give way to him. He was going to just kill him and get him out of the way. And, and Martin and Daly and Margaret Wilson talked about the young male syndrome. I mean, that's really what got going with Oedipus. But you know what? It did not work out so well for Oedipus, and it doesn't work out so well for most of us to just pursue those competitive status competitions blindly and in the short term thinking because uh, there are big long term costs to that well and road rage is a good example where the 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 difference between this environment and, and the other one is uh, and the ancestral environment is worth keeping in mind i mean first of all uh in the hunter gatherer society if you feel rage if you feel that someone has insulted you or taken something from you and you have to show the world that you can't be taken advantage of your, your rage is playing out in front of an audience of people that, that matters that they're going to see you every day. And the guy who did it to you is going to see you every day with, with road rage. You're, 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 you know, you, you may get yourself killed and there's actually nobody watching who matters. Right. So uh, there's not too much about this in, in this book, but my previous book about commitment has a lot about this. You know, why do people, why are emotions so irrational, Bob? I mean, why do people get mad in ways that they can't even control? And I think the answer to that comes from game theory. I mean, if somebody gets mad and you don't know if they're going to do something wild, uncontrolled, that's not even in their interests, they might try to murder you even though they'll go to jail for life. If you don't know about that, you're going to be much more wary than if you know that they're going to be rational actors. 
So I think we all are programmed literally to let our emotions take us over at times because that makes us more potent actors in a social scene. Straight right. game theory. Right. Um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, it's not totally unrelated. The game theorist Thomas Schelling said, you know, if you're playing a game of chicken, if, if you're driving a car directly at another car, the smartest thing you could do is, uh, if, you, if this were physically possible, tear out your steering wheel, throw it out the window in full view of the other driver. That might seem crazy. It <laughs> makes you look kind of crazy. On the other hand, it'll probably get the other driver to swerve. Right. Um, so let's talk a little about jealousy, and maybe you can actually prepare me for, I'm going to tape one of these tomorrow with Jeffrey Miller, whom I'm sure you know of. I don't know if you know Jeff. Yeah, he, he wrote sure. a book called The Mating Mind. He's broadly in the evolutionary psychology tradition. I don't know if you know, but he's lately become a, a, a champion of uh, uh, pol- polyamory. How do you pronounce it anyway? It's like polyamory. Uh, yeah, it's like. Lots of people having sex with lots of people. He, uh, relatively unconstrained. Uh, a sex life not terribly constrained by commitment to a given partner. And well, I'll be interested in what he has to say because in those of us who grew up in the 60s, you know, we all thought we were going to form communes and everybody was going to have great sex and give up that socially constructed jealousy stuff. And it didn't work for one single commune. It never worked. <laughs> so the idea that somebody evolutionarily sophisticated can think that can work is pretty interesting. Well, this is what I'm going to ask him. And this is why it surprises me a little that uh, that he's into this and, and thinks it's practical. I mean, he's a smart guy. I'm sure he'll have good answers to the question of, of you know, doesn't human psychology you know, make make it pretty perilous for people to go around, you know. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but but that, that, That'll be interesting. But jealousy, as you mentioned, is another, as David Buss puts it, a dangerous passion. It can't be controlled very easily. It causes untold suffering and murders. And it'd be better to just do away with it. But it's yet another emotion that is bad for us in all ways, but often good for our genes. Terrible. Yeah. Now, it, it's a good question. I mean, should you, in theory, like if you could get rid of the emotion of jealousy, I mean, you're living in a modern environment, say, and you have a mate, maybe you're even married, you've had some kids, but you know that if they are fooling around on the side, they will use contraception. So it's not like they're going to have kids that are going to lead them to withdraw commitment from your kids or anything. If you could control jealousy, would you say, sure, go ahead? I mean, it, why should we observe the, the natural selection's mandate to, uh, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. So there's this huge sea change that you, I'm sure, are aware of like I am because we're in pretty much the same generation. Um, I see people now, I mean, previously, um, people used to be concerned about who they had sex with because they knew they were going to get attached to that person. And so they often waited. Now I see people limiting their attachments so they can have more sex with other people without getting the pain of losing someone that they feel close to. So some people I've talked to say they never have sex with the same person more than once a month because otherwise they're afraid they'd get attached and then they feel bad um, if it ends. It's such a complete change of trying to control sexuality, which we used to do before, to try to control attachment, which seems to be more common, at least in some small segments of the population now. Now, is this a gender symmetrical thing? You find this as common in men as in women? I can make predictions, but I don't know. (laughs) Trying to stay out of trouble. Um, Yeah. The... you're in a better position probably to observe this than I am. I mean, you, you, you actually see patients still, right? And some of them are probably... Not any, I mean, I'm full-time running my center and being okay. president of the society and things. So. But you are at a university where there are young people. So my question is right. about the so-called hookup culture and the question of to what extent it actually exists. I think maybe you and I might both be skeptical that it could be a very smoothly functioning system for reasons we've already kind of hinted at, right? Yeah. Uh, wh- what is your sense? Is it real? Is it like, is every, are people happy in it? Do you know? You know, we need data. I don't have data. Yeah, no idea. But it yeah. still is supposed yeah, I hear people talking as if everybody hooks up with everybody, and it clearly is a different social attitude than back in the day. 
Um, but what is what's really going on behavior wise and what's really going on feeling wise that needs study. Yeah. So um, talk a little about shame. Is that a, is that a, is that a common commonly reported problem uh, for clinicians? You know, sh shame gets much closer to self-esteem and it's very different from guilt. You know, guilt is when you violated some rule and, and you feel personally bad about it, even in the, in the depths of the night. Shame is much more when you violate some social norm that's more of an arbitrary kind of thing and you're not living up to the expectations other people have of you and that lowers your self-esteem. So yeah, all these feelings. But you know, there's lots more in the book other than emotions. I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about behavioral problems and sex and maybe even the more severe disorders. I'm trying, I was trying to get you to talk about sex. Uh, keep go, say whatever you want about it, yeah. You know, I, I was reluctant to put that chapter about sex in the book because there's one quite speculative, but I think quite potentially useful explanation. I mean, ask yourself the question, why on earth isn't the sexual response better coordinated between men and women? I mean, there are whole chapters in every book on sexual disorders about why men tend to have orgasms too soon and what to do about it, and why women tend to have orgasms later or not at all and what to do about it. There's never a chapter about why that is. Why are men and women different? Mm -hmm. and a fairly straightforward potential explanation seems to me to be that what if, what if women had a response like men? They had their orgasm and immediately stopped. And sometimes it was before the man at his climax. Well, mm -hmm. that woman would have fewer offspring. Yeah. Now, in fact, women don't get the kind of sensitivity that men get after an, os after an orgasm in general. But some what do. Mean, what do you mean by that? Sensitivity in what sense? Well, m many, most men immediately after having an orgasm do not want to continue right. intercourse. Right. And that's a good thing because otherwise it would pull sperm out of where they belong. Um, this gets a little graphic. So it's, just, you know, it's a little hard to explain without being graphic, but from the woman's point of view, a woman who also you know, suddenly wanted to stop, as some women do, and she would have fewer children. Right. So natural selection is going to shape that system to be infernally you know, frustrating to both men and women. Uh, to have a discoordination of orgasms. Yeah, which uh, which doesn't mean you shouldn't. I mean, just because the system is naturally frustrating doesn't mean you should shouldn't try to do anything about the frustration. This reminds me of something I heard about. I don't know, twenty five years ago, probably. I think it was at one of these human behavior and evolution societies that some evolutionarily minded therapist had said. You know, a, a, a couple uh, came to them uh, complaining about premature ejaculation or something. And the therapist said, that's not a problem because that's the way, I mean, the function of sex is to get the semen where it belongs and you're done. You, you, you succeeded. And I was thinking, well, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, you might. If that, if that was the case, it would be more like chimpanzees and bonobos who do it for a couple of seconds since that's that. But something else very interesting is going on with humans. I think it has to do with bonding and attachment and all the rest. Yeah, well, uh, there, that is a thing in, in, in our species and, uh, you know, an important one, the fact that it is natural for male and female to pair off and stay together for an extended period of time. We form bonds and, and no, so few species do men, males ever provide much care for children, except in humans where it's huge. Mm -hmm. So what else do you want to talk about that we haven't talked about yet? We haven't talked about eating disorders, rampant. Oh, yeah. Oh. Why on earth? I mean, first of all, why are we all too heavy? That's, that's easy enough. It's because we have more good food and less exercise than ever before, and the system was never designed for it. But why do you get people into, get into these cycles of, of dieting and vomiting and losing weight with anorexia and, and bulimia and all that? And here, too, I think you know, I, I put a bunch of new ideas in this book that I haven't really published specifically before, except in very short articles. The one about the sexual discoordination is new. But this one also, I mean, there's a mechanism about what the, what the organism should do when there's a famine. And when you're starving, uh, what goes off is a mechanism that makes you eat any food you can get as fast as you can before anybody else can get it. And guess what happens when people starve themselves voluntarily for a day or two? I mean, all of a sudden, they open up the refrigerator and they discover, oh, my God, there's a half a gallon of ice cream empty. How did it get mm -hmm. empty? Oh, wait, I'm feeling sick. I must have eaten it. Um, and then what that person does is either vomit or just think, oh, my God, I am going to become a blimp. 
I've got to try harder. And it leads to a cybernetic positive feedback cycle. There's, there's a whole chunk in the book about cybernetics and about how the essence of disease is dysregulation and how modern environments often lead these normal regulatory mechanisms to go into positive feedback vicious cycles that end up with disease. Same thing with drug abuse. You know, the, you take some drugs a few times and all of a sudden the learning mechanism grabs onto them or they grab onto the learning mechanism and you're trapped. Uh, spending the rest of your life trying to get drugs instead of doing other things. So in the case of an eating disorder, what is the trigger? I mean, you've explained why once the, the, the system is in motion, the feedback system uh, leads to this fluctuation between overeating and undereating. But what is the trigger that's peculiar to the modern environment that sends a person into the system? So we all know that we see pictures in magazines and movies and billboards of all these super attractive people, generally thinner than almost any real person. And that, plus the fact that it's mega social millions instead of just seeing six or eight people around us in our, in our small group. And we're competing with all of them uh, to look good on YouTube or whatever. Um, I mean, the competition and the sexual um, market where everybody's competing to look good. And these are really vicious competitions based on body shape and all the rest. It's no wonder people pay attention to them and telling people, oh, don't pay attention to it. Yeah, right. Um, you know, that, that just doesn't work very well. So my, as you're suggesting, modern environments create both the images and the huge competition, and they make it pay off bigger for those winners and worse for those losers. Um, it's really a nasty business. If we could all not pay attention to these things, it'd be nice, but we can't do that. Yeah. And do you have anything to say about the world of social media? I mean, this is something that has really sprung up only in the last decade. It's definitely different from the form of socializing that came before. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been skeptical whenever people ask me, is social media creating epidemics of depression? And there's been news releases in the past couple of days about an article just published in the psychological literature about rates of depression and suicidality in young people. And it's pretty convincing. Finally, we have pretty good data that something is happening only in young people, um, 18 to 25 where their rates are increasing in the past six or seven years, pretty much congruent with the rise of big-time social media. So I don't know if that's the right answer or if that data will turn out to be confirmed, but once again, we're doing things that we were never prepared for, and I think we'll eventually come to recognize the kinds of attention we get on social media as really very much like crack cocaine. I mean, we, were in, you know, we have social obesity, I call it, you know, we, we can't stop our consumption of opportunities to display ourselves and get feedback from other people. And some people just do that full time. That's a good point. I mean, never before have so many people had at least the theoretical possibility of getting so much social affirmation at right. any given moment. I mean, there's something they can do. They can always do to try to get a massive amount. It's massively gratifying when it happens. But it's not. I don't know. You might become Kim Kardashian. Although yeah, not you. <laughs> that's, an, that's, that's something for us all to keep in mind. Um, mm. I think I can proudly say that has not happened to me yet. Um, the, la the last thing in the book, while we just have a couple of minutes left, um, there's also a whole chapter about the really serious mental disorders, like bipolar disease and autism and schizophrenia. There's not time for us to talk about it here, but I was, I was kind of tickled that Psychology Today chose that one to extract and publish as an article last month. And that the theme there is that we have not found any common genes of large effect, even though these disorders are mainly caused by bad genes. So now what do we do? And the suggestion I'm encouraging people to pursue is that maybe the genetic variations that influence who gets these disorders aren't all caused by bad new mutations. Maybe it's more that we should be looking at the trait and the idea that possibly natural selection has pushed some traits way up to a point where fitness is maximum, but way close to a point where you could fall off a cliff edge and have the whole system collapse like a bone breaking. Yeah. So there's no, no time for us to really go into that now, but anybody who's interested in those serious disorders will also find something in the book about that. And that also points to a kind of distinction. On the one hand, depression can sometimes, right, just be sadness 
that maybe because of the environment you're in kind of festers. And that's one thing that doesn't necessarily have any kind of genetic basis that's peculiar to the individual. On the other hand, bipolar tends to, to have a genetic component. That's for sure. Absolutely. So thank you, Randy. The book is uh, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, Insights from the Frontier of Evolutionary Psychology. Um, psychiatry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's a reflex at this point. I pronounced the phrase know, evolutionary psychology so many Anybody times. who's interested, everything about the book is at a website called goodreasons.info. You'll find everything will, at goodreasons.info. And we'll link to the Psychology Today excerpt. You said that's where it is, right? It's like today. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that'll be on the uh, meaningoflife.tv uh, website, uh, not on the YouTube channel, but on the website. And uh, if there's anything else uh, you want us to link to, we'll do that too, Randy. Thanks for taking the time. Sure. Have enjoyed talking to you. Great to see you again. Hope to see you in person sometime soon. Same here. Thanks a okay. lot.